It's a four-letter word that will transform global taxation. BEPS, base erosion and profit shifting refers to the complex structuring done by multinational businesses to artificially shift profits to low tax countries and pay little or no corporate tax. The OECD estimates that 100 to 240 billion dollars in tax revenue is lost every year due to such tax avoidance. That's 4 to 10 percent of global corporate income tax revenues. And so in 2013, the OECD issued 15 BEPS action points. And earlier this week, after several rounds of consultation, it issued final BEPS standards. Hello and welcome to The Farm. What will the OECD's efforts to fight base erosion and profit shifting mean for India, Indian companies and Indian multinationals? This week, The Firm polled 12 top tax experts to find out. First, I asked them to identify the key impact areas. The top impact area for all 12 tax experts is disclosures. Transparency is one of the three pillars of the BEPS program. OECD recommends that countries design a mandatory disclosure regime to obtain information on potentially abusive tax schemes and their users. There's also a new template for transfer pricing documentation and there's country by country reporting of revenues, profits and taxes paid. Essentially the, the BEPS in its uh, action plan 13 have kind of required uh, a three tier documentation so they're going to revise the transfer pricing documentation guidelines uh, to provide for a three tier documentation which would include uh, preparation of a master file uh, by the multinational enterprise preparation of a local country file in each of the countries where the MNC is operating and a country by country reporting. I think it is uh, more this country by country reporting that is causing uh, a bit of concerns for all multinational enterprises, uh, be it Indian or foreign. Uh, essentially what it would require is that uh, it would require uh, that key economic factors of every multinational enterprise be put up on a, on a, on a single piece of paper and uh, put it up and that information the country by country reporting would be available uh, to the tax authorities under the automatic exchange of information. So essentially if a multinational is operating in India, uh, the tax authority at one go can is able to see what kind of profits it derives in Singapore, whether the, the profit derivation in Singapore is linked to the value creation or is it just a shell entity and uh, the profit is just lying as it is. Or and so all these key economic factors like the sales, the profit volumes, the number of employees, the key functions, all that are again getting captured under the country by country reporting and that is what is uh, required under this action plan. So that is one thing which uh, uh, multinationals, uh, especially Indian multinationals would be kind of a little bit wary about. All 12 tax experts identified transfer pricing as the next big area of impact. OECD wants to align transfer pricing outcomes with value creation so that operational profits are allocated to the economic activities which generate them. EY's Vijay Ayer says legal contracts may no longer be the sole basis for determining transfer prices. Tax expert TP Ostwal says transfer pricing will get further complicated. A BAP section plan on uh, from 8 to 10 deals with uh, aligning the transfer pricing outcomes with value creation and in which case they say that uh, uh, intangibles is a major imp uh, major force uh, in terms of defining where the profitability would lie. Uh, while defining intangibles and while talking about intangibles, uh, OECD has played a lot of importance on some of the factors like marketing intangibles, the workforce, assembled workforce, uh, location savings and everything. So all these concepts, uh, the Indian tax administration were trying to put it across in making adjustments. So you have seen huge adjustments being made on marketing intangibles by the Indian tax authorities. Location saving comes up in almost kind of each and every captive uh, cases. So all these uh, concepts were already used by the Indian tax administration. Now with OECD kind of putting its stamp of approval on some of these things and regarding them as a, one of the important uh, uh, competitive factor, it would just kind of put more force, uh, more force with the Indian tax authorities in terms of using this. I don't see any need for making any legislative amendment to these, to these uh, recommendations or guidelines because transfer pricing is not a matter of law that you need to, uh, you need to amend and you know, instill transfer pricing in the, 
in the revenue administration of a country. It is to be understood, it is to be practiced. So OECD is part of BEPS have given these guidelines. Now these guidelines do not, please understand, these guidelines do not redefine transfer pricing. They actually, I would say, uh, instill the transfer pricing provisions or explain the transfer pricing provisions in a greater detail. So one would need to, uh, one would need to adhere to these principles when, uh, when, a, com when a company uh, administers this transfer pricing, when a company sets its pricing policy with its group companies, and the way in which it will create, it will create a transfer pricing documentation, defenses, and, and also the manner in which the ad revenue administrators would also um, look into the transfer pricing matters in, in, in audits and in, in appeals, etc. 50% of the tax experts polled identified treaty abuse as the next big area of impact. The OECD has laid down new anti-abuse rules that address treaty shopping. Countries must make a clear statement that they intend to avoid creating opportunities for non-taxation or reduced taxation. The LOB or Limitation on Benefits Rule will be included in the OECD Model Tax Convention, as will be a more general anti-abuse rule, that is, the principal purpose of transactions test. The concerns, of course, have been double taxation and double non-taxation. That's where, you know, this sort of thing starts from, and it, it's a valid concern on both counts. Now, as we sort of go forwards and, you know, what we effectively see here uh, is, again, a move where much of it is now around the concept of principal purpose test. And most of us who have been looking at GAR long enough, you know, understand that the elements are not very dissimilar. But when we talk the principal purpose test, you know, it's easy enough uh, to sort of say that, well, it is not solely a tax purpose. Uh, but what then happens is that when you look at the rest of what the commercial rationale is, and you might find that rationale, but people are increasingly inclined to also say that relevant to this rationale was this particular territory or location, the one which afforded you the best opportunities for that so-called commercial rationale, or in a manner, has tax actually conditioned that at the end of the day? So, you know, one completely agrees with the principal purpose test. Uh, I think there must be a global synergy on how it will be interpreted, uh, because, you know, if you have differential interpretations, uh, that would be quite disastrous. Well, five of 12 responses listed dispute resolution as a key impact area. OECD has set down minimum standards to strengthen the effectiveness and efficiency of the Mutual Agreement Procedure, or MAP. In practice, the experience on MAP is, has been mixed. It takes quite a lot of time because two governments have to agree. Now, what the BEPS report has done is to say we need to do something to make MAP much more effective uh, in terms of process, in terms of timelines. So, in a sense, that is good. So, it will provide possibly one more additional dispute resolution mechanism in terms of it being a little more meaningful. I'd like to point out here though that 20 countries including the UK, USA, Japan and Australia have agreed to provide for mandatory binding MAP arbitration in bilateral tax treaties as a mechanism to ensure that treaty related disputes are resolved within a specific time frame. India has not signed up for this as yet. Now for the next impact area on the list. The OECD also intends to make changes to the definition of PE, permanent establishment, in the Model Tax Convention to prevent the artificial avoidance of permanent establishment status. You know, firstly, in terms of PE, I think in India we've sort of explored and re-explored this issue judicially, you know, quite often. And I do believe that our jurisprudence is a little more mature than anywhere else uh, in the world. So in a way, you know, we need to see whether our jurisprudence will get called into question and whether this will all sort of override that. But, you know, we've gone a pretty, pretty considerable distance in identifying what a PE will be. So from my perspective, you know, as I look at this, the three or four key questions which come up is, you know, one is definition of a PE and effectively what are the criterion or ingredients. To me, the other key issue will be profit attribution. How much will they actually attribute to the PE, uh, you know, in the context of the incomes which are generated? 
I also suspect that, you know, this direction on PE is clearly uh, more subjective and if at all one would have liked it to be far more objective. Uh, my other sense is from an Indian perspective, compliance and, you know, administrative burdens will rise. But the ultimate truth of this is, you know, what impact will it have on treaties? How much will we take from this and weave into the treaties? Uh, because that will then ultimately define A, the relevance of this uh, as a concept in India and B, you know, the jurisprudence we already have, do we sustain it or does that now need a relook and a reinvention? Well, the changes to the definition of permanent establishment or PE will also help meet the challenges arising from the digital economy. Interestingly, while OECD lists this as action point number one, only three of the 12 tax experts I spoke to seemed concerned about the impact on the digital economy in India, probably because it's still at a nascent stage. Now, I'm going to take a quick break here, but stay tuned, because on the other side, I ask if the attractiveness of the Mauritius route will go down and effective tax rates will go up. Welcome back. This week, the firm polled 12 top tax experts to understand what the BEPS is going on. Now let's talk about Mauritius. We already know that India and Mauritius are renegotiating their double tax avoidance treaty. The BEPS program makes that easier for India as it proposes several anti-treaty abuse measures that we've already spoken of earlier in the show. For instance, the limitation on benefits or LOB rule and the principal purpose test. Also, 90 countries are currently working on a multilateral instrument to amend all bilateral tax treaties and give effect to OECD's BEP standards. So, does all of this mean that here on, fewer investors will use Mauritius to root investments into India? Grant Thornton's Arun Chabra says, post BEPs, it is likely that India will pursue renegotiation of the treaty and introduce a specific LOB or principal purpose test. This will impact the attractiveness of Mauritius as a hold co jurisdiction. But BMR's Shefali Guradia believes that unless India and Mauritius both sign the multilateral instrument which incorporates standard anti-treaty abuse provisions, there should be no impact on this treaty. Yet she agrees that in the long run, more companies will prefer to invest directly rather than through intermediate jurisdictions like Mauritius. V. Lakshmi Kumaran puts it differently. He says, Mauritius in all likelihood will continue without much change. BEPS is aiming to prevent unintended treaty abuse. The India-Mauritius treaty is unlikely to get affected by BEPS, except that there may be introduced a clause relating to limitation of benefits. So the India Mauritius Treaty is already under renegotiation. I think a lot, a uh, significant portion of the renegotiation has already taken place, as that is not in the public domain. Uh, the OECD uh, BAPS plan would kind of give more political advantage to India to, or a more bargaining power to India to kind of negotiate with Mauritius and pu put the effective limitation of benefit clause, ensure that Mauritius does not kind of uh, allow the treaty shopping to be done. So the, these recommendations are in line with what India wanted. And uh, that would help India to renegotiate the treaty more firmly with Mauritius. And we will see a less, more and more uh, kind of uh, uh, disclosures to be made in respect of the investment holding companies, etc. So overall, with this kind of uh, steps being taken, the use of Mauritius or any other special purpose vehicles as an investment holding company would reduce over a period of time. I think it would be jeopardous not to take account of all of this. And if Mauritius and India really intend this to be significant, I think the renegotiation must reflect uh, at least all of the anxieties which are here and at least all of the principles uh, which will gain currency uh, over a period of time through what we have here. More disclosures, more substance, more anti-abuse measures in treaties and a new definition for permanent establishments or PE. Add to that, rules ensuring that hybrid instruments and hybrid entities as well as dual resident entities are not used to obtain unduly the benefits of tax treaties. Plus there are new CFC rules. 
OECD has also laid down a fixed ratio rule which limits an entity's net deductions for interest to a percentage of its EBITDA. The list of BEPS-related changes are many. And that brings me finally to the impact of BEPS on commonly used corporate structures. Dhruva Associates CEO Dinesh Kanabar says cross-border structures using lower tax jurisdictions are most vulnerable. So there is a limitation of benefit clause which has been suggested, which is so extensive. It's not perfunctory like the one which you have between, for example, India and Singapore, but is very, very extensive. And if adopted uh, in the tax treaty between, say, India and Mauritius, Singapore, Cyprus or whatever else, will mean that most companies investing through these jurisdictions, if they really do not have substance, will not qualify for the benefits of the treaty. And therefore, uh, abuse of those treaties will now stop. Next on the impact list are structures involving third-party debt or hybrids. We have a very peculiar situation where a foreign company investing in India through a CCD would regard it as equity for the purpose of FDI. The Indian company which is issuing the debenture will regard it as a debt. And there is there being no thin capitalization norms, the entire interest would be treated as a deduction. It is quite possible that in the country from which the investment is made, such a CCD could actually be regarded as equity because it is compulsorily convertible into equity. It is not a debt instrument really. And therefore, one could really use such a hybrid instrument to ensure the recharacterization of income. So therefore, for example, if interest was paid, that interest would be tax deductible in the hands of the Indian company, but the recipient overseas could treat it as, as dividend because it is characterized as equity from the country in which the debentures have been subscribed to. What BEPS is doing is to, is to provide really that such recharacterization uh, ought not to be accepted. It provides for two separate measures. One is it provides for a limitation on the quantum of interest that one can reduce from the profits of an enterprise and therefore thin capitalization uh, to an extent is, 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 is a, a put a ceiling to. And thereafter it says that if an instrument is characterized differently in two countries, there can be two implications. One implication could be in the, inst in the type of structure which I mentioned to you. India could deny deduction for interest. In the alternative, if India does grant deduction for interest, then the income would be characterized as taxable in the country in which it is received, notwithstanding the fact that the amount is characterized as equity. So there is a primary and a secondary adjustment which is proposed, which will sort of uh, ensure that you are not carrying out an arbitrage of this nature. Structures that involve ownership of intangibles will also have to adapt to the post-BEPS world. There are two parts to the whole discussion. Uh, at this point of time, intangibles are regarded as base in the country in which they are legally owned, uh, subject obviously to meeting some of the substance requirement. What BEPS action plan is recommending is that it is irrelevant where the legal ownership vests. An intangible is, re is required to be taxed in the jurisdiction where it is created. So if, for example, you had a situation of an Indian a pharmaceutical company, a IT company, which was developing a product, and that product was done, so to say, on an outsource basis in India, but the legal ownership was situated overseas in a low tax jurisdiction, that was put it, it was possible to argue at this point of time that the ownership was there, the income was there, all that India as a developer is entitled to is merely the cost of development and an appropriate markup, but not really the profits arising from exploitation of the IP. We are now moving to a regime to say, where is the value created? And which is the country which really bears the economic risk with regard to the creation? And that is the country uh, where such profits would be, would be liable to tax. Therefore, structures which are used to move IPR out uh, into a low-cost jurisdiction may meet a very, very rigorous uh, uh, condition of substance and may actually fail. Net-net, will BEPS result in a higher effective tax rate for Indian companies, especially Indian multinationals? The poll verdict is mixed. KPMG's Rohan Potterfaker says yes, 
as the income attribution to India operations may increase. Amit Patel disagrees. He says the aim of the BEPS project is to avoid double non-taxation as well as double taxation. Therefore, although this will increase the compliance burden on Indian companies, in the long run, it will reduce tax rates. V. Lakshmi Kumaran says tax rates may increase, but at the same time, the Indian government has promised to reduce rates as well. While Finance Minister Arun Jaitley has welcomed OECD's efforts and emphasized the need for genuine and equitable multilateralism, how and when India aligns itself to the BEP standards will determine the changes that we've discussed today and hence the ultimate impact on companies. How much do we really decide to take on and in what form do we take it on? The second is we've often seen that there are global laws but India tends to give some of these issues a very municipal and local interpretation. If that is what India is still going to do, then you know there will be a concern. Uh, because every time that our administrators have had latitude, uh, the results have not been spectacular uh, for uh, the entirety of the business community. So I think that will be you know, one of the concerns. And lastly, you know, my concern is how is this going to impact other taxes? Because, for example, intangibles, we're already seeing that it has almost a co-equivalent uh, impact in both transfer pricing and customs valuation. So as we move forward, you know, in terms of direct taxes and that realm, how will this impact indirect taxes uh, will also to me be a concern because many of these issues directly will have the propensity to shoot up the burden of uh, indirect taxes. There's also the issue of different speeds of adoption by countries across the world. The move to eliminate double non-taxation shouldn't result in double taxation. Well, that's it from us on this BEP special. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next week. The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters.